Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I hope some more people will migrate in and uh, that uh, we will have the panel staffed. Of course, uh, beauty before age, uh, that goes also for the presenters. But we have a wonderful panel here. It's a big panel. So I asked uh, each uh, panelist uh, to go for five to seven minutes that at the end we would have a few minutes for question and answers. We all know that uh, we have uh, an issue of migration very differently accentuated in the various regions uh, compared to the world population and to regional population. It is a small number of people, but it has a, an immense impact in internal politics in uh, most of the countries. We will certainly also address the issue of the status of uh, refugees. We all know that the Geneva Convention that was convened and adhered upon by roughly 50 countries uh, a few years after World War II is not covering climate refugees, for example, or the protection is only covering crisis and uh, war refugees. So another open issue for the multilateral uh, world. But uh, let's start uh, to talk to you and prepare the short questions at the end so that we can answer quickly. We have the former Prime Minister of Latvia and also President of University in Latvia, Madame Laimdota Svaryuma, please. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hello to everybody. Migration is a complex uh, process. On one hand, immigrants help to solve demographic problems of uh, recipient country and how development uh, of economy from other side, it is uh, somehow threat, threat and burden of social institutions and competition with nationals for the jobs. In Latvia, in uh, previous decades, we have both processes, emigration of, of, from our country and immigration. And if we calculate from 1991, in 1990, we regain our independence, about 600,000 people left Latvia. It is uh, 23, about 23, 25% of our inhabitants when we compare with year 1991. Uh, we have some waves of emigration. First was uh, after regaining of independence in, 90, in the beginning of 90s when uh, people emigrate uh, uh, to former Soviet Union uh, countries as their homeland. A second wave of emigration in Latvia we had in years 2008-2009 when uh, we had economic crisis and Latvia was hit uh, very strongly by this crisis. We had at that time uh, unemployment 14 percent and in 2008-2009 uh, people emigrate uh, mainly to EU countries. Uh, to Ireland and uh, Great Britain at the time. Great Britain was in EU. And uh, from one side now we have very hard um, um, policy to help people re-emigrate because economy of Latvia rises up and uh, people are ready to re-emigrate from, uh, from Emigrate uh, from uh, emigrate home, and we have special policy for immigration, special tools to help people go back to Latvia, and uh, we have special coordination offices in all our counties and Riga to help free of charge people uh, 
to find jobs in Latvia and, and uh, have a living uh, place. According to a uh, survey made by uh, Latvian University, people mainly go back to Latvia because they are longing for Latvia and uh, they want to be with their families and uh, mainly people go back for personal issues, not economically. Only 12% of people go back because they feel that there will be better uh, job uh, proposals in homeland. From other side, uh, we have immigration process as well. And uh, generally, balance, immigration balance in Latvia all time is negative. More people go out, less people em immigrate in Latvia. Only we have balanced migration, um, uh, migration in, 19, in uh, 2021. Because in that year we had uh, um, four times more immigrants from Belarus, according to uh, the situation with the Lukashenko regime. Of course, we have immigration uh, now in 2022 from Ukraine, Ukrainian refugees. And here we have really broad, broad consensus between politicians and, uh, and uh, society, we want to help refugees from Ukraine. And uh, our parliament accepted special law to avoid restrictions or bureaucratic restrictions for refugees from, uh, from Ukraine. And our civil society, non-governmental organizations have special uh, service blocks for uh, free of charge for Ukraine people. So, there are, I, I want to mention that it is not only Ukraine immigrants we have. Latvia has 10% of our citizens, of our inhabitants, they are non-citizens. They are people who didn't want to get Latvian citizenship. These are people from previous Soviet Union and they have no citizenship uh, from another country, but they didn't want to be Latvian citizens because they don't know, Lat know Latvian language. They need not, uh, they don't feel necessity to become citizens of Latvia. And uh, it is be easier for them to go to Russia because they need not visa to go to Russia. And therefore, it's really not easy task for, for government to organize immigration policy in this case. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Of course, uh, I guess uh, a number of Ukrainians uh, do not migrate to Latvia because it's too close to the border, to, bo to the <laughs> giant. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's you are afraid, but we are living in border with Russia yeah. all, all our lifetime no, as Latvian no, Republic. We have the title for this panel, Migration as a Symptom of World Poverty, Inequality, Climate Stress and Conflict. I had some issues with myself on the word symptom. If we would replace symptom by consequence, then probably we have the answer to the whole question. Prime Minister of Moldavia, uh, Cyril Gaburici, please, you have the floor. Thank you, moderator. Uh, I am totally agree with uh, Madam Prime Minister that uh, this uh, phenomenon of migration is a very complex issue that needs approach, uh, a very attentive approach. The countries, in some of the cases, are suffering a lot from, from migration when this process is uh, uncontrolled or disorganized. And countries are suffering from both sides, from the 
the country from where people are living and the country where people are going. If, again, I'm repeating myself, if the process is uncontrolled and disorganized. My country, Republic of Moldova, is in the list of the countries that suffers a lot from the population exodus. I don't have exact figures, but um, we don't have uh, uh, in, in general, but uh, the most optimistic, op optimistic figures are showing that in the last three decades, we lost around 30% of our population. And these are the people who want to work. These are the people who can work. These are the people that can be at the base of a development of the country, base of the economy of the country. Today, Republic of Moldova is a uh, vulnerable and social um, weak country, I would say, from economic point of view. With a population of 2.6 million people, out of these 2.6 million people, we have 700,000 of old retired people. We have another 100,000 of people that are beneficiaries of various allowances from the state. We have an another 200,000 that are uh, civil servants of different levels, and we have another 100,000 that are people working in the education and health uh, um, uh, organizations. So I'm, I, I'm sharing this figure with you to understand how big is the load and the burden on the economy of the country. The phenomenon of migration uh, for Republic of Moldova is a condemnation on the country's failure. The decision to leave the country is, uh, in most of the cases, uh, a very tough decision for, for those people, first. And second, is loaded with a lot of emotional charge. The decision to leave in my country, in most of the cases, is done because people want a better life. They are looking for better work. And conditions and uh, conditions to live with their families, education, health care, and so on. So this is staying at the base of taking this tough and, and um, um, charged with emotional emotions uh, decisions. At the same time, we were mentioning about refugees. Uh, in the last year, since the war started in Ukraine, we uh, managed to be a place of almost one million refugees that came from Ukraine to us, but they continued their way towards European countries. Only 70,000 uh, of them uh, stayed with us. Uh, they are trying to find a work uh, place. They are trying to give their, um, themselves, to find themselves a job to, in order to have some, some occupation. Um, but now, <clears throat> what? should be done. I, um, I am lucky to be a, a, a person uh, educated in a multi multinational com uh, company where um, a lot of investment or, was done in order to have the top managers uh, trained, well trained. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we were uh, trained, it was to um, take the responsibility for your decisions. It's normal, it's human uh, to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Mm -hmm. But the art of uh, being a good manager, I think, is to uh, be able to be responsible for your mistakes. Uh, first and second, to realize them and recognize them as soon as possible and to react. And I think uh, we have to admit that in the last years, we as humanity, we made some mistakes. Uh, we didn't realize them or we didn't recognize them in time. And uh, what is happening today, the um, instability, the lack of security, I think this is the consequences of those uh, mistakes done in, in, in the previous period of time. And mistakes are done not in terms only uh, of decisions, but also mistakes are done in terms of setting up the priorities. When it comes to, to, to our topic, I believe that we have to address to the roots of uh, this problem, and this is uh, poverty, this is uh, environmental uh, disasters, this is, this is uh, conflicts or wars, uh, and of course we have to be ready to give the support for those regions, countries in, um, in need. And we should start to create or to build the peace building measures that would uh, 
balance and will stop the war all over in this world. The <clears throat> also, there is one thing which is very important in my, my opinion is the international cooperation and coordination of this issue. And the countries, in my opinion, should work together to be able to share the best practices, to be able to develop joint policies and also to be able to provide assistance to those in, um, in need. I'm a product of um, uh, democracy and I'm the follower of democratic model of government, but I'm, I, um, that doesn't stop me to state that uh, we people, we are different and we will continue to be different. And the democracy for me is the art of having the dialogue and the good will to come up to a um, common conclusion or to some compromises, which is okay for a, for a democracy. <clears throat> I think in, the, um, in terms to mitigate the negative effects of migration is a uh, need of an honest dialogue and a respectful dialogue among uh, countries, among each other. And we have to understand one, one important thing that today's problem of the poor, weak countries is tomorrow problems of those countries which are economically more, more developed. It is responsibility of both sides, both governments uh, of, um, of this issue, where people are living, from where people are living and where people are, um, are going. I, I see the, the solution of um, uh, migration to be done as a big global project where um, all the countries are entering as a part of the project member, let me call it this way, and where we set up very correct and very, very clear the targets, where we invest in education, where we, we invest in um, promoting the know-how, where we try to, to, to give the opportunities and the chances to those people in those countries where they are lacking this kind of opportunities and um, the chances. I think we have to build the nations, strong nations that can cooperate, that can uh, work in peace and in, in a, uh, harmony, in honest, in dialogue. And I think uh, we have to remember always about our differences and respect the differences um, among us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. You, of course, mentioned two extremely important words. One is to avoid conflict <coughs> as best uh, means to lower the number of people in need of shelter and protection. But you also mentioned the access to migrational partnerships when it comes to development, when it comes to investment, when it comes to education, so that uh, we all know in, uh, globally migration is a need, but uh, most of the countries want to control the migration and the uncontrolled uh, migration seems to become very quickly an internal problem in so many countries. Even so, the figures might be low. But uh, we come back at the end. Uh, please uh, prepare your answer to that too. Then we have our next speaker. He is uh, Vusal Husainov, Chief of State Migration Service of the Republic of Azerbaijan. So it's your daily business to deal with different type of migration. Please, you have the floor. <coughs> Thank you. Dear Mr. Post, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased and honored to attend this flagship event of Nizami Genjavi International Center. I would like to welcome all our guests and express my gratitude to organizers for providing me the opportunity to share my insights on this important and actual topic. Indeed, uh, migration is an everlasting and as noted complex phenomenon caused by a variety of uh, reasons which include poverty, climate change, inequality and uh, conflicts. Uh, these are also covered within our panel. And migration is also getting increasingly pressing issue in uh, global agenda. 
And this is also can be seen easily from the statistics of international migration. Even at times of COVID pandemic, when uh, strict limitations were applied to border crossings, when general perception in the world was that human mobility approached to zero level, still we observe positive dynamics. As if we look at the number of international migrants in 2019, we see that it was 272 million. A year after, in 2020, we observed 282 million uh, international migrants. And unfortunately, climate change and conflict-based uh, migrants contribute significantly to this number. As according to the last figure, there are 89.4 million uh, displaced people, and more than half of this number are conflict-based displacements. As a representative of country uh, which witnessed for decades uh, forced displacement, and uh, we know the grief consequences of, of forced displacement on IDPs, and even after 2020, uh, when uh, territorial integrity of Azerbaijan was restored, and at the same time, right of IDPs to return back to their homelands, we still have much work to do to ensure that return is dignified, settlement is sustainable, and reintegration is effective. Despite numerous measures uh, carried out globally to eradicate poverty, to uh, tackle the root causes of conflicts, and at the same time to mitigate uh, negative impact of climate change, it's harsh reality that today these threats are key drivers in uh, international migrants' uh, number. And uh, I uh, agree with Mr. Foss that uh, maybe the word symptom should be changed to the consequences, mm -hmm. but in no way we should see the migration as a problem. It's a need and it has a huge development potential. And I think that we right now focus more on making migration to work for development and to contribute to mitigation of poverty, to contribute to minimizing the negative impact of forced displacement. Migration is uh, beneficial both for sending and for receiving communities. For receiving communities, it's uh, new skills, new knowledge, it's strengthening of workforce, it's uh, diversity. But for sending communities, among others, I would like to emphasize the role of remittances. And again, I would like to refer to the numbers. According uh, to recent statistics, uh, the num total sum of remittance flow to middle income and to developing countries is 626 billion US dollars. This number is much higher than entire uh, budget for global uh, assistance projects. So what should be done? Of course, we should focus more on drafting, developing uh, uh, better migration policies. We should take measures to prevent uh, inequality and discrimination, and we should promote uh, cross-border cooperation. And of course, there are many measures, and we do not need uh, to reinvent the good uh, measures. They are all well written in international documents, in protocols of this kind of discussions. Just one document I would like to refer, this is the most updated and uh, most comprehensive one, that's the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. And I believe states, just by following the objectives of this document and by concentrating more on implementation, can achieve better results. And another challenge here, of course, is the capacities at national level. How we can implement, understand, and adapt these requirements to the local needs. And I would like to note very important project which Azerbaijan carries out with uh, International Organization for Migration. Last week, we had the privilege to sign a memorandum of cooperation with IOM to establish regional training center on migration in Azerbaijan. And the major purpose of this uh, center will be to provide uh, trainings and education programs with most updated curriculum and with uh, tailored to the needs of the region. And so far we organized uh, numerous uh, trainings uh, with participation of more than 200 representatives of uh, regional countries, partner states, and I believe in near future Azerbaijan also will be able uh, to provide 
uh, excellent capacity uh, to regional countries and at the same time will be the uh, new platform for regional cooperation. At the end, what I would like to say again, uh, migration is a necessity. Migration is something we cannot escape, but we should adapt. Therefore, I think the what we can do at this point to concentrate our efforts to make sure that migration contributes to development and to ensure that cooperation is at all levels and among every stakeholders. Only by that we can make migration to work for development and uh, to minimize the effect of forced displacement. Thank you very much and I would be glad to respond to any of your questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for giving us an insight in your work and the scope of how you look at uh, migration. When you go through the UNHCR statistics, uh, there is a, a certain tendency towards uh, exponential increase of asylum seekers to Azerbaijan. It has probably to do with the advanced stage of development. If uh, you just look at the statistics, but maybe there are other reasons for doing so. Then we go to another continent, uh, South America. We have Marie Angela Holguin, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Colombia, not all too far back. You have particular experience uh, in the region and you have also a whole history of migration in different directions. So please let us uh, know your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank Nisami Ganjavi Center for the invitation. Um, it's uh, just a few presents of Latin America in this forum. And so I am so happy that two of us are here in, uh, in, that, uh, in that podium. Um, we have the, the huge experience um, with the Venezuelan migration since 2015. So this has become a, um, a big effort, not only for Colombia, but for the rest of Latin America. Uh, the figures are there are seven or eight million Venezuelans that uh, go out from, from their country, and we have uh, three. Um, Colombia, Colombia, for the conflict and for, for its history, uh, have many Colombians uh, in other places in the world, especially Ecuador and Venezuela. We had a huge migration since uh, the 70s um, because Venezuela has a, a, in a very good economic situation. So many Colombians went to Venezuela for work and there are something like four million uh, in three decades. Um, and now there are many of them that come back and, and, um, and the Venezuelans are, uh, uh, you know, they, they feel a little bit more in, at home, if I can say something, in Colombia because they have parents and they have, uh, you know, friends and, and, uh, and relatives. Um, so, but I, I think this experience I want to take out uh, lessons. So I am going to start with the lessons and then I explain a little bit how was, how was the, 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 the situation. The first one is that, um, you know, receive migration, just one country is so difficult. You have to have, you know, a integration of, of, uh, of a, like, a, you know, to, to, to think uh, more countries in how is going to face that situation. And, uh, and because of the, the political problem in Venezuela that start to, to, to come much more complicated, 13 and 14 and 15 in that years, um, you know, the, the conversation about Venezuela in the regional mechanism become very difficult in the OAS, in uh, UNASUR. So was was an issue that you cannot talk about it. Um, so the, so, so the problem was become more, much more difficult. So we, we decided in a certain moment in 2016 to organize a group that we call the Lima Group. Um, it's some countries that we, we start to receive Venezuelans and talk about the law in migration. 
Because the problem for Colombia, as, as we live in the moment, is that the many countries could, could close the border and every, every Venezuelan just stay in Colombia and it's, it could be really very difficult. So is to, as a, as a group, as a country, in, 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 to start to, to, to see if we can you know, share migration law. Um, at the beginning was was fine, but then there are many countries that close close the border, and uh, and you know we are the corridor to go out from Venezuela, much more than Brazil. So many people cross Colombia to go to Ecuador, Peru, or Chile, or Argentina, but many many st st stop in Colombia just to think if the situation in, in Venezuela just. Uh, become a little bit uh, smooth, they can come back to, to their country. Um, so the problem in Venezuela at the beginning was economic and social and political, but become a humanitarian situation in, very, in, a, very bad, uh, in a very bad years, like, like 2016 and 17, is the lack of food, the lack of medicines, uh, you know, the lack of, of doctors, the lack of many things. So the, the people decided to go out. Um, and when migration, when you see the migration, the 60% of the migration stay in the neighborhood, just to, to, to keep a little bit of the uh, hopes that the, the things can change. So this is what we, we receive, these six million, six million uh, um, Venezuelans. So what we do, um, at the beginning we decided, since the beginning, that Venezuela was so generous with Colombians for decades. So we have to open the door and we have to give them, you know, the opportunity to stay in Colombia. And we organized that we call the PEP. It's like a permission for a stay along, along periods. Um, and with this, with this uh, permission, they can have a health care in urgence in, in the whole, whole hospitals in Colombia, the education for, the, for everybody, um, you know, school and uh, maternity, and um, and also the, the a social status for work in Colombia in a good condition as a Colombians. So we we receive so many people. To now it is like three million, but um, the help, the economical help for of Colombia is is. is quite difficult, it's not, we, we just, I send, as a minister, I send people to Turkey just to learn how they receive the Syrians. And, uh, but the, there are different, there are a, a huge difference. But they say something that, unfortunately, we, did, we didn't um, do it, and I think it's the most important. It's the register of the people who know exactly who is the person who is in, in the country. How come you can help them with some a little bit technical education and, and found works, and not only in some places, in all over the country? This is what the, the Turkish uh, say to us, and, uh, and I think what's, uh, this is one, uh, another lesson. You have to know which is the people that you have in your country to help and uh, to look for, a, you know, for a better life. Um, and I think the other lesson you have to that, that we learn is that when you see the first, you know, action, the, f the first steps for a migration, you have to react. Not just to wait one million, two million, and, and start to react. You have to react since the beginning. And I think Latin America had mm. um, that problem, and I think this is uh, yeah. it's a, it's a, a, le a lesson to learn. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess uh, the cross-border family relatives uh, to uh, also play a considerable role in this force and pack uh, migration. But uh, I am, do not know whether I am right, but uh, the issue of refugees in your country related to Venezuela got somewhat out of the international press. You don't read anymore about it. Is it a good sign or is it a bad sign? I think, I think it's a bad sign, you know, um, because it, it, I, I think it's because of Ukraine, you know, Ukraine become for immigrants in the, in the first stage, even if the figures are a little bit the same, I think Syria and Venezuela is the worst and then 
uh, Ukrainians now, but this is the point. Uh, and you know, when the European Union was uh, very, very generous with the, with the region, and they they gave money two million, two million dollars, two million euros. But the problem is that it's not it's, this money doesn't arrive to the governments, uh, to the education minister or to the health ministries, uh, through NGOs or through the United Nations uh, system. And, and this is a very, very complicated for the budget of, yeah. of the government. Thank you. I give the word to the next speaker, Mr. Abdulaziz Alvajiri, former director of ISESCO. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And uh, I. I'm very honored and pleased to be part of this forum and I would like to thank the organizers for preparing this platform for all of us and uh, giving us all the care and uh, hospitality which will help us of course to complete our mission here as uh, speakers and the intellectuals who will tackle uh, very important issues to the world community and to the world at large. The issue of this panel is uh, migration, and I would like to talk about migration from Africa uh, to some European countries and compare it with migration from other parts of the world to Europe. Uh, I'm very sorry to say that uh, there is a double standard in dealing with migration and immigrants. Uh, if we consider those who migrated from some African countries, from North, North Africa or the South of, uh, of Africa, the Sub-Saharan countries, during the colonization period, and consider them immigrants, this is a big uh, fallacy. Because those countries were under the rule of the colonizers, and the citizens of those countries were uh, under the, the, uh, the control of those colonizers. So they took them there to work and to help them develop their countries. They didn't immigrate because they wanted to leave their countries. We have to talk about the, the, the immigration that is existing now after those countries have had their independence and some of their people immigrate to Europe and other countries because of many factors. Uh, bad governance, repressive governance, lack of opportunity in economic uh, fields, wars and conflicts, and uh, they, they go uh, unwillingly because they, they, there is no hope for them in their countries and they want to seek a better life so they can raise their families and educate their kids and live uh, in a decent uh, environment. I uh, worked in Esesco for the, more than 25 years uh, and ISESCO is the Islamic Educational Scientific and uh, uh, Educational Organization, uh, a specialized agency of the Organization of Islamic Conference. And it is based in Rabat in Morocco. So I am in Africa. And I have been in Africa for 38 years. And I traveled in many African countries, and in Europe also, and some other parts of the world. Most of those who emigrate are decent people. They are not criminals. They are not terrorists. But look. If you compare the treatment of the immigrants from Africa or from Syria, for, ex for example, with the treatment of the Ukrainian immigrants, eh, this is really a human disaster. You remember the story that was in the media <laughs> that, uh, that a, 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 a British couple hosted a young lady from Ukraine. And the husband got in love with that young lady and left his wife and kids and went with that young lady. Did you hear any story of a European family hosting a refugee from Syria or from Africa? Never. So there is hypocrisy here, a double standard. I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize Europe or the West at large. Europe and the West are the basin of the modern uh, democracy and the modern advancements in science and technology and uh, good governance. But they have this small problem in their minds. 
not all of them, some of them, who look at the, the human race with different yardsticks. Good people and bad people. And this is wrong. In Morocco, and I'm not going to praise the Moroccan government because I live there, but in Morocco, there are many African from the sub-Saharan countries coming to Morocco, they want to go to Europe. Some of them, and many of them, couldn't do it. And they settled in the Moroccan cities. What did the Moroccan government do? Did they push them out of Morocco to their countries? Never. They gave them uh, citizen, not citizen, they registered them and gave them cards so they can live there and work. And most of them now work. I saw them by myself. They work in factories, they work in farms, they work in other uh, you know, disciplines, and they were uh, protected by, the, the, by the, the authorities of the Moroccan government. What happened in Tunisia lately is a shame, because they shouldn't do that to the, to the Africans. Because I know Africa is a rich continent, and the African people are very good people. I visited many of the African countries, and I have very good relations with the presidents and the prime ministers and the ministers and the intellectuals in the universities. Most of those people are fine people. They are not criminals, they are not terrorists. They don't cause any threat to the world. So let's stop this kind of dealing that is based on good and bad, beloved and hated. This is not humanitarian. This has nothing to do with human rights. This, this has nothing to do with the modern world ethics. And I am going to stress the last comment here. Let us be human beings. D despite of our colors, languages, religions, backgrounds, where we come from, let us deal with each other as human beings. I was very pleased to go to Latin America many times. I visited many Latin American uh, countries. And I think the Latin Americans are like us, the Arabs. They are hospitable, they are open-minded, and they are not racist. So let's be like us and the Latin Americans. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abdulaziz al -Vajiri. Very strong words, but uh, maybe I could uh, resume that by uh, referring to a Nobel laureate in literature who lived in my country. He wrote Elias Canetti. He wrote in his uh, book, The Province of Humans. If you want to understand the face of the world, you can find it in one human being. As long as the human being respires, as long as he is taken care of, as long respires the world. You see, we should continue the dialogue. Then we come to Madame Rosalia de Aga Serrano, President of Ecuador, and we will certainly hear some pairing with uh, your experiences and Madame Holguin, just the speaker before. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here again, one year again, in this uh, big family of Nitsami Gajavi International Center. And thank you for the hospitality to the people of Azerbaijan. Um, well, I don't want to repeat what Maria Angela says about what's happening in Latin America. Uh, Latin America is underrepresented here because we are only the two of us, but I'm happy that we choose to talk about this uh, uh, migration issue. In previous uh, um, moments, I, uh, in, in other years, I talk about governance and I talk about education and um, about environment. Uh, because of my previous work in the Amazon Basin, being uh, the general secretary of the Amazon Basin, I had to deal especially with environment and issues. But uh, now I prefer to talk about migrants because it's uh, an issue that is uh, touching very hard in the world, but especially now in Latin America. I came from a country, Ecuador, that is a country that expelled a lot of migrants to other countries, especially to United States, to Spain, 
and also to Italy and probably other countries abroad, but mostly the three, the three countries. And uh, it was uh, because of economic reasons. After 2000, in 2000, we lose our currency and adopted the US dollar. Ecuador started to be very attractive for uh, working uh, market, uh, for labor. Uh, uh, like working in Ecuador was good for uh, many Latin Americans and we received a lot of Peruvians and also people from um, Cuba, from Haiti, and uh, of course, a lot of Colombians. And um, during this time, we have uh, a lot of uh, migration uh, searching for work and also for, a, uh, for security because uh, Ecuador has been always a very pacific country. And uh, nowadays we have a million of Colombians living in Ecuador, especially because of economic issues and also because of the violence in, the, in our neighbor country. And uh, we receive a lot of Venezuelans too. Uh, during these last years, two million of Venezuelans crossed it about, uh, uh, cr crossing to, uh, from uh, uh, Venezuela, Colombia, and uh, goes to Ecuador, and then to Peru and uh, Argentina or Brazil or other countries, and uh, uh, half million stayed in Ecuador. Then we have a million of Colombians, uh, half million of Venezuelans. But I, but I must call the attention that Ecuador as, is a small country compared with our neighbors, uh, Col Colombia and Peru and other countries in Latin America. Then we probably feel more the presence of Venezuelans and Colombians than in other countries, even if we know that uh, there are more uh, Venezuelans in uh, Colombia and also in Peru. But, uh, um, compared with the number of populations, we feel more the presence of uh, the people from other countries living in Ecuador. Ecuador has been an open country. During that time, even we have the universal citizenship. Amazing. But it was uh, some declaration and some law that now is uh, modified that uh, any person in the world need a visa to go to Ecuador. Yeah. It uh, was in certain way good because we are friendship, we are open, but in other hands it opened the country for non-desirable uh, 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 people, especially the cartels of narco-traffic of uh, uh, Mexico, Colombia, and other countries, even from Europe. And that's a reality that we are suffering now. The situation is hard, and um, uh, the, the economic situation of the country also is not uh, enough to support all the circumstances that we are living. Then we call the attention to the solidarity of uh, the international community, because as uh, our uh, previous uh, speaker talked, uh, probably, uh, and, and also Maria Angela talk, uh, the focus of the, migra of the international community is more on what's happening with Syria and Ukraine, that we are very solidarity. We are, we are, we are uh, begging, uh, asking for help for the people from Ukraine and Syria, of course, but call the attention about what's happening in our continent, in Latin America, especially with the exodus of uh, maybe nine million of inhabitants. Some people say six, seven, eight, probably nine million of people uh, that leave the country because of the situation in Venezuela and more of them are in the neighbored countries like Colombia, Venezuela, Peru and other countries. Um, what we can do, I am now leading an NGO uh, called it FIDAL and we are working on mi migration since uh, three years ago with some German and Italian cooperation. And uh, we are providing what we know to do is providing education, especially training the migrants about uh, how to be an, an, uh, uh, a small business person, how to, to start a, a new 
uh, a new company, a new occupation, to provide uh, tools of uh, working like seed capital and also training for the Venezuelans especially, but also Colombians that are living in Ecuador. Uh, in this sense, we provide education and also um, tools uh, how to work and how to live in Ecuador, how to deal with authorities. Uh, we uh, have agreements with universities to provide uh, um, uh, advices in terms of justice, how to, to, to work in Ecuador, how to live in, in our country. And it has been a very successful project. And I'm calling the attention to that because we can do a lot, uh, not only the government, but also the civil society to provide tools and uh, also to create good understanding in between the people that arrive with the Ecuadorians. Because in sometimes it could uh, be some kind of xenophobia saying, well, the, the jobs are dividing. We are not getting all the jobs because the foreigners are, are having them. Then we are working also with the Ecuadorian population uh, plus the other, pop, uh, other people that came from Venezuela especially to work together and maybe to have some business together and to work together in terms of uh, how to solve the situations that uh, they have and how to manage it. Another issue, uh, a very hard issue, is about education uh, process. Uh, during the pandemic times, probably Latin America is one of the continents that suffered the most because uh, we closed the schools almost two years. Uh, UNICEF and UNESCO says that we lose 10 years in education and it's affecting also the migrant population because uh, if the schools were closed and um, the budget for, for schools are not enough, that's another big situation. Also during the COVID pandemic, uh, a lot of people uh, that they, they don't have refugee, they don't have a job, they don't have possibilities to work and to access to social security especially migrants, suffer a lot. Then that's, that's another um, space that uh, we need to call the attention and to know how we can uh, work on terms of education and health issues like it was talked uh, before during the, uh, the last panel. How to deal with uh, vaccination, how to deal with uh, provide uh, uh, primary health attention, to the migrants. Um, well, uh, that's uh, the situation in Latin America. Um, we hope that we can find uh, solutions, at least uh, part of the solutions inside the countries, but also okay. we are appealing to the international solidarity in terms of uh, uh, what uh, we can do and how we can work with the population that is arriving. And it's not stopping. It's not okay. stopping. People continue leaving, leaving uh, Venezuela and going to yeah. our countries. Then we must have really? some, some sorts you. of solutions. I promise you, Madam President, that like in my country, you will have the last word on the panel. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's a promise. <laughs> yes. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, we come to our speaker, Mohammed Mahmoud Abdel Salam. He is uh, the Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Elders, co-president of Religions for Peace. I do not know whether you speak in Arabic or in uh, English. Yes, I will speak Arabic, inshallah. Okay, then... Uh, I do not know and, uh, who has their, uh, uh, interpretation. the possibility the to uh, listen to it. Uh, we here at the panel, we have. Thank you, please, yes. you have the floor. You can choose the channel one, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
شكرا جزيلا وسعيد للغاية بالمشاركة في هذا المنتدى المهم منتدى باكو العالمي الذي انعقد في الدورة العاشرة والذي استطاع بحق أن يستوعب العديد من التحديات التي يواجهها عالمنا المعاصر والمهم واللافت للنظر أنه يضم نخبة من المفكرين والمثقفين والنخب العالمية السياسية والدبلوماسية ذات المستوى الرفيع وهذا يثري النقاش و ويثير أيضا الانتباه للاستفادة من هذا الكم الرائع من المعلومات والحقيقة أنا أبدأ بتقديري لك السيد مدير الجلسة على إصرارك في حديثك دائما في قضية المهاجرين عن التحدث بمنطق الهجرة غير النظامية هذا المصطلح الذي ينبغي تكريسه والتركيز عليه لأننا للأسف في عالمنا أتحدث عن عالمنا العربي والإفريقي وأيضا عن الإزدواجية التي تحدث عنها متحدث السابق الدكتور تويجري وقد أحسن في هذا وأنا أؤيده أيضا لأن لدينا استخدام الحقيقة مسيء لهذا النوع من التحدي العالمي الكبير حين نقول أو نستخدم مصطلح الهجرة غير الشرعية هذا مصطلح نحن نتحفظ عليه تماما والحقيقة أنه هذا المنتدى المهم يركز على هذه المحاور وبخاصة هذا الموضوع الذي نتحدث فيه اليوم حول الهجرة باعتبارها واحدا من أعراض الفقر في عالمنا وارتباطها بعدد من القضايا التي تكاد كل واحدة منها أن تشكل ملمحا مهما في واقعنا كانعدام المساواة والتأثيرات المناخية والصراعات التي رأينا كيف دفعت بالملايين من ضحايا الحروب والنزاعات في السنوات الأخيرة إلى حركة نزوح غير مسبوقة في حجمها وحجم ما أبانت عنه من مظاهر الخوف من الآخر وتصنيفه نمطيا بناء على رؤى عنصرية وتمييزية وبالإضافة طبعا إلى الخطابات الشعبوية التي تحمل مسؤولية الأزمات الاقتصادية والاجتماعية للهجرة والمهاجرين وقد يعني أفاد في هذا أخونا الدكتور عبد العزيز لا أريد أن أكرر وأتفق معه في كل ما قال والحقيقة أنا سعدت قبل أيام قليلة في كنت في روما وكان هناك مؤتمر ويلتون بارك يضم مسؤولي الحريات الدينية حول العالم وكان الحديث مكثفا حول هذه القضية والحقيقة أنا يعني دائما ما أتجنب عن قصد استخدام مصطلح الهجرة غير الشرعية لأن هذا المفهوم يرتبط بأبعاد أخلاقية وحقوقية تتجاوز المعايير القانونية في كثير من الحالات لتلامس معاني غائبة في واقعنا العالمي للأسف الشديد رغم أنها تتعلق بجوهر إنسانيتنا المشترك وهي العدالة بين البشر في توزيع الإمكانيات الإمكانات والاستفادة أيضا من الفرص نحوط البحر الأبيض المتوسط كما يعلم الكثيرين للأسف الشديد يعد واحدة من أكبر المقابر الجماعية لضحايا محاولات الهجرة السرية من جنوب المتوسط إلى شماله من جميع الفئات العمرية وبخاصة فئة الشباب وهؤلاء هم خلاصة تضافر انتهاكات حقوق المواطنة كما تعلمون والحريات وغياب العدالة الاجتماعية في بلدانهم الأصل سواء في بلدانهم الأصل أو أيضا في مهاجرهم الاضطرارية التي يعيشون فيها مشكلات التضييق على حرية ممارسة الشعائر الدينية أيضا لأن هذا أحد الأسباب التي يعني تدفع الكثيرين للجوء وأثار الصور النمطية التي تلاحقهم بسبب انتماءاتهم الدينية أو الثقافية ولعل مشكلة الإسلاموفوبيا التي تتسع مظاهرها بالطراد مؤشر واضح على هذا الاتجاه ودعوني أؤكد أني أتحدث عن معايشة كوني جئت من العالم العربي حيث أظن أنه ما من منطقة في العالم تتأثر بالهجرة القسرية حاليا بالقدر الذي تتأثر به المنطقة العربية إذ يمثل سكان هذه المنطقة 5% من سكان العالم لكنها تستضيف 32% تقريبا من اللاجئين و38% من النازحين داخليا بسبب مشكلات الفقر المزمنة وازدياد حدة الحروب ووتيرتها 
وايضا استفحال تحولات تاثير التحولات المناخيه والتغير البيئي والتنقل الحضاري الحضري لهذا ارى من المهم مساهمه في مثل هذه المنتديات لفهم ظاهره الهجره وتحليلاتها من خلال ثلاثة أبعاد تحظى بالقدر الأكبر من الراهنية والإلحاح الأبعاد القانونية المتعلقة بالمهاجرين واللاجئين والنازحين ومشكلات اللجوء والنزوح القصري بالإضافة إلى تقييم تجارب الاستقبال في الدول الغربية في التعامل مع الهجرة من البلدان المصدر الحقيقة أن حكومات العالم اعتمدت في الوقت الحالي لغة اقتسام أعباء ما يتصل بمسألة التعامل مع اللاجئين وهو أمر بلا شك يعزز نوع من الفصل العنصري العالمي وذلك بسبب انتماء معظم اللاجئين إلى العالم الأقل تقدما نتيجة لا لاختلالات اقتصادية وأمنية في بلدانهم فقط ولكن نتيجة لحالة من انعدام العدالة الاجتماعية والعدالة في استفادة من الإمكانات و أيا كانت هذه الإمكانات وأيضا في تحمل الأعباء والاضطرابات التي يشهدها العالم من الناحية الأمنية والمناخية من جهة أخرى الحقيقة أن الأمر مؤسف في التعامل مع نتائج هذا الوضع الذي يتجه أكثر فأكثر إلى اعتبار المهاجرين عموما عبء ويدفع إلى اتفاقات حول حلول مؤقتة بدل وأنا أحيي الأخ الزميل من أذربيجان الذي تحدث عن الجانب الإيجابي أيضا لهؤلاء المهاجرين وإسهامهم في تنمية البلدان التي فروا إليها ولدينا نماذج في العالم تؤكد هذه الظاهرة فالكثير منهم أسهم إسهاما واضحا في ارتقاء هذه المجتمعات التي عاش فيها بالطبع بدل الاستثمار في الإمكانات البشرية النوعية التي يمثلها المهاجرون فقد تم تحوير الهدف الحقيقي للاتفاقية الخاصة بوضع اللاجئين مثلا من خلال ادعاء أنها تهتم بتحديد التزامات حماية اللاجئين في الملاذ الأخير فحسب أي أنه يجوز إرسال اللاجئين روتينيا إلى أي دولة أخرى تقبلهم دون تعريضهم لإعادة لخطر الإعادة القسرية إلى أوطانهم الأصلية وتستخدم هذه الحكومات حزمة من المغريات والضغوط حتى تجبر الحكومات المرشحة للاستقبال لأن تكون دولا ملاذا أخيرا لقبول مثل هذه الصفقات الحقيقة أن مسألة الهجرة يعني هي مسألة تحتاج إلى تعامل من وجهة نظري تحتاج إلى تعامل جدي من المجتمع الدولي هذا واقع موجود يقر به العالم بالنسبة لنا هو موجود منذ عهد النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الذي يعني حين صعب الحال عليه نبي الإسلام محمد طلب من أصحابه أن يخرجوا إلى الحبشة فرا من هذا أو فرارا من الظلم وصعوبة الحياة في هذا الوقت وأنا أحيي أيضا الزميلة من الإكوادور لأنها تحدثت عن جانب مهم جدا وهو دور منظمات ومؤسسات المجتمع المدني في التعامل مع هذه القضية مع اللاجئين اللاجئين يعني والمهاجرين فضلا عما يعانونه من عذابات وآلام حين يذهبون إلى الدولة يجدون رهاب شديد جدا من الخوف منهم أتحدث تحديدا عن اللاجئين من أفغانستان الذين فروا إلى دول من حول العالم وبعض الدول الأوروبية ويعانوا من مشكلة الاندماج ولذلك واجب المؤسسات ومنظمات المجتمع المدني أن تساعد في هذا في إدماج هؤلاء ليكونوا بناة في المجتمع وأيضا للتخفيف من رهاب هذا الرهاب الجديد رهاب المهاجرين واللاجئين أنا أشكر لكم على هذا المحور المهم وبما أني آخر المتحدثين فأعلم أنه يجب أن أكون مختصرا فشكرا جزيلا والسلام عليكم شكرا شكرا أني شكرا I speak Arabic yes. only foolish way <laughs> but thank I am still understand uh, thank you uh, here we are at the end of our round of presentations uh, let's just uh, recall the UNHCR statistics that we have roughly 96 uh, million people, 53 million internally displaced, 
and most of them due to climate or environmental degradation. We have 32 million refugees, uh, a, where the status of refugees is given. We have 5 million asylum seekers, and that 5 million uh, is practically in Western Europe dominating the whole internal dialogue, which is uh, wrong. I'm absolutely clear about that. And there are about other five million people in need of protection. But let's also make clear 72% of the, these uh, 96 million people, they are just coming from five countries. Syria, seven, Venezuela, nearly six, Ukraine, seven, Afghanistan, South Sudan. And uh, we should not lose that out of sight. But we should also make clear so far, last year, 200,000 returns. So the gap of uh, whatever status the migrants or the refugees have and the number of people returning is uh, in great disparity, and that causes again certain internal political problem in the discussion in various uh, parliaments. But we should also not forget the 4.3 million stateless people who have not a kind of a passport or an identity, uh, national identity. I uh, dare to mention here that uh, there is another figure we should not uh, leave out of sight. There are people who earn a lot of money with, uh, I call it unwanted migration. And that business, according to the Spiegel, uh, the German magazine, is uh, last year was uh, accounted to seven billion dollars. You know what people who want to migrate, for example, from African countries or elsewhere, they pay a lot to do so. They are sometimes chosen by their families in poverty to go there to earn money. But there is also another figure, the amount of remittances, returns, monetary returns of uh, uh, migrants is uh, practically double the official development assistance of the world. And hence it is not much contributing to the economic development, it is contributing to increase consumption or to let people come out of their immediate needs. But uh, we have to bear in mind these figures when uh, it comes also to what uh, you can see in Europe, uh, some radicalization in uh, some uh, parliaments where political parties who put the migration issue in their political program, they automatically out of nothing, they make 30% of the votes. That is a big, big concern. Now, I open quickly the floor. We have 8.04 minutes uh, to ask question. Uh, I'm Remusa. A very quick question, please. In fact, I know you know the answer for it everything. It is a very quick observation. The absence of uh, Africa and African representatives from this uh, panel raises a lot of questions. So thanks for Dr. Dwigri and for Dr. Abdus Salam for mentioning the African uh, dimension. But the African dimension is so serious in the issue of migration and for all those reasons. So I hope that this should, would be borne in mind that there are so many issues, Africa should not be absent. Ex excellent. Let's call that back to those who organize the forum but you are a member of the Board of Trustees, <laughs> so you, you are there to Absolutely. insist. That is why it is an observation. But 
that yeah, we sure, have to sure. do that and to deal with Absolutely. it. Absolutely. The other thing is about the culture yeah, yeah. of how to welcome and treat and exactly. deal with exactly. the refugees. And this is an observation addressed to Europe Very and European good. society. I yeah. had a good friend historian in Burkina Faso, and I often sat with him in the evening to discuss. And one day when I spoke about migrations, how easy it was within Africa, how difficult it is to go to certain other regions, he said, Vous allez jamais être en mesure d'arrêter la mer avec vos bras. You will never be able in Europe to stop the sea by your arms. I wish you to know that in, Afri in, in Egypt, we have 9.1 million migrants and not a single camp. All of they have been Very absorbed good. into the society. That is why that needs it is a question applause. of culture. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Then Mr. Galteri and then the gentleman with the big financial figures. <laughs> yes, Galteri, please. Uh, Chairman Walter, uh, I will uh, really uh, thank the organizer to uh, have this panel. But the point which I don't hear it is the impact of climate change. Environmental refugees <coughs> By year 2050, they may shoot up from 200 million to get close to the billion by 2080. What are we going to do with this? Especially, there is no law up till now in the UN system for the environmental refugees. They are left alone. They have nothing to do what mm. happened to them. Somebody else has caused the climate yeah, change. Yeah. And therefore, this is in the Absolutely. loss and damage of climate change, as is spelled out in Sharm el Sheikh in COP27. Uh, it's, it's an agony. What will happen? Because this will cause socio political upheaval, not only in their own country, but in the countries they go to it. And part of it, it's only what we are seeing with all the colleagues in the panel. Yeah. This is just a simple, small example. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, the, when you look at newest modeling studies about climate change and the impact of climate change on humans, then you see an exponential uh, uh, upwards trend in climate refugees. And the middle uh, leveling is considered by 2050 that about 60 million people will have to be displaced because of climate change. When uh, Antonio Gutierrez, when I retired from my function, he was uh, head of UNHCR, he came to me and said, look, can you not, in the Global Humanitarian Forum, address the issue of climate refugees? And said, why? Why don't you do that in UNHCR? He said, we have a governance structure where the board and the constituency, that means the countries, when he puts it on the agenda, they will immediately say, this has nothing to do with the Geneva Convention, so take it out. So that's why we started then, and later on the World Bank joined and uh, UNDP, uh, but it was difficult, it was climate uh, refugee and shelter, was uh, the first studies were called. But now uh, you can talk about it. At least there is a certain progress. But uh, you see the difficulties. Yeah, the gentleman. Yeah. And then the lady. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, OK. I'll, I'll be very, very short. Because uh, I want to give uh, uh, add a couple of figures. You, you gave some very interesting figures, Chair. Uh, climate change in Africa. Today, we had some of the worst droughts in the Horn of Africa, and we have 50 million people suffering from food insecurity. We have about 15 million people suffering from food insecurity in the Sahel. Now, those people cannot stay where they are. Yeah. They ha uh, and watch the children die. They move. 
And most of them move to other African countries. We got, heard an example of what the Moroccans are doing or what the Egyptians are doing. Uganda is another uh, great country that is receiving lots of uh, refugees. So uh, uh, I think that when we talk about uh, migration, we need to think about what we can do to deal with adaptation to climate change, uh, as well as what we can do to receive the migrants, because it will happen Thank anyhow, you. as, as your Burkina Bay friend was saying. Uh, Thank you very much, very clear. The young uh, lady from Afghanistan and then Farida. And Hi, then um, so my name is Hila, I'm from Afghanistan. Uh, I'm part of the Young Leaders Group. So I have one question and one comment to all the panelists. The first question is just, I want to echo what Mr. Aziz says, the double standards when it comes to how refugees are treated. Um, I've been a, I'm in a refugee, I'm a refugee right now in UK. I've been through the system, I know what the system is. So my question to all the panelists is how, what are your approaches to avoid selective activism when it comes to supporting refugees? Because refugees are discriminated in your system based on their color, where country they're coming from, and religion. So if you can provide concrete examples of what those approaches are and how you have dealt with this. And a comment that I have in this panel, I think some of them echoed that some countries are underrepresented. Why we are not giving voices and panel uh, space to the victims of migration and victims of uh, extreme poverty. We have panel discussion like this, but we are not seeing young representative because most of the refugees are going to other countries are young people. They have been discriminated, they are being shot by the border police, and women are even facing gender-based violence and sexual harassment while they, do the, while they okay. are in refugee camps. So to the organizer of this panel, but also the panelists and representative of different countries, if you're going back to your countries and going to organize another forum, please okay. give voices and platform to the victims of gender uh, victims of migration and extreme poverty. Bring them so they can share their stories and the real discrimination and realities on the ground. I think we don't need more political statement and diplomatic statement. We need to hear the stories and voices and experiences of real people who have been through the system. So okay. it was really important to Thank address you. this. Thank you. Then uh, we will answer. We will answer. Farida, please. Farida, please. Oh. And then Mr. Ryan. Thank you very much for this young lady from Afghanistan. I, was, I want to uh, ensure that I was going to focus on what she has been to uh, talking about. Micro. I happen to be a refugee. I went through the experience of being a refugee many years ago. Loudspeaker. And, and I can see although... You, you once were a pop star, so please keep the oh, micro close okay, to them. Okay, okay, okay. So, let us confess to the following. The refugee problem is a big problem, complicated problem. It will escalate to be even more complicated. I happened when I was at the European Union, maybe 40 meetings in different committees talking about refugees. I attended a summit in Malta about refugees, strategies about refugees, policies about refugees, discussions about millions and millions of dollars have been spent on these agendas, policies, the question that we need to put on the table, where is the failure and what is the new thinking out of the box? Because I fully agree, women and children and young girls, even in Libya, even in Libya, in the, in the refugee camps, the situation is disastrous, is sad, is difficult. It's a combination of so many injustices, and we cannot hide them. In countries where we have political instability, it's a business. Many people are making thousands and millions of money of these refugees. Many of us, as mother or grandmothers, when we sit in front of our television and we watch these people dying in the Mediterranean, how we feel, how we feel. So I, don't, I, I, I recall very much how much I cried when I saw uh, Prime Minister Merkel accepting all those Syrian refugees. I live in Lebanon. There are over one million refugees in Lebanon. 
as Amr Musa have said, nine million in Egypt, over a million and a half in Jordan. And Lebanon and Jordan are poor countries facing many, many, many problems. So I Good. think we need to say, yes, we, I, I have to thank some of the countries that have been trying to help, but the problem I strongly feel that we need a revolution within the UN system, within the EU. We need to be bold enough to say why it has not been solved, why we are repeating over and over the same political this, uh, talk about what's going on with refugees. Enough Thank you. is enough. Solutions Thank you, uh, Farida. Uh, you didn't lose stamina over the last 15 years. You are still an activist uh, of uh, first order. Thank you. Uh, then Mr. Chair. Ryan and then the gentleman from Geneva. And then, yeah, oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want one word. Is the efforts that were undertaken by the UN on migration and refugees. Let us not forget the UN Global Compacts, both of them, migration and refugees. Yeah. And I would also like to follow up on what my former chairman and mentor, Peter Sutherland, yeah. uh, said in 2017. His Sutherland report, which was at the origin of these global compacts, wanted to send out a positive message on migration. Yeah. There are only 280 million migrants in the world. This is manageable. So there is a possibility of managing positively migration in favor also of development. These were Thank you very not. much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Then uh, the gentleman, uh, yeah, here, and then here. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, he, he has a study. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm also the former prime minister of Romania. Um, but today I'm indeed president of the university in Geneva. I slightly disagree with Mr. Vusal Hussainov and fully agree with with, of course, my friend Amul Moussa and Mr. Aloudri. Uh, migrants could be beneficial for the countries uh, as a workforce for the countries receiving them. But what about the human development in the countries they leave? This is really something we have to worry about. The combination of climate change and very, very slow human development in Africa makes that uh, in seven years from now, we'll have seven, 170 million young people in Africa uh -huh. under 18 with no prospect to find shops. of life. So can we, we can, and we should, we should better manage the problem of local Migration. It, it's, it's morally, it's morally uh, really by n unsustainable now. But, but we cannot manage a wave of global migration. So the first urgency, the first urgency is to support human development, especially in Africa, education. With, uh, with many money, we'll have, with a lot of money, it's a, it's a generosity, but it's an interested generosity for the European or American, but especially American for Latin America, for Europe. It's very well spent money in education in Africa. Sure. That's the point. Huh? Thank you. you. You convinced me fully. I was there in 15, uh, during 15 years head of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. We had cooperation in education in 42 African countries. I never left my country when the finance commission of one of the parliament chambers was in session, because be, Switzerland, because, because they always cut back when I was not there. So by avoiding that, it was possible to maintain, and I never got a budget cut over 15 years. I'm still proud of that. But uh, I fully agree with you, and I would uh, extrapolate that for much longer. Yeah, please. 
Hello. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, chairs, honorable chairs, and panelists for the very important discussions. And please, for a member of Cambodian delegates, and uh, as some of the panelists already point out, that the global immigration is a global issue that requires international and cross-border cooperations. But right now, we also have a tendency, a trend, to discuss about the end of globalization, the anti-migration uh, uh, sentiment there, and also the. Uh, uh, it become a hot topic in domestic politics in uh, every campaign. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep, and then they are lead to the stringent uh, uh, re regulations. So the question is, do you foresee brighter or gloomier uh, prospect for uh, international um, uh, immigration? Thank you. Thank you very much for the comment. Now uh, time is up and we are reminded one minute, sorry. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, just to give a, a short yeah. statement back to the questions or to the concerns. Thank you. Migration, it is not only solidarity of recipient countries, it's responsibility. It's responsibility that these people who come in will have education, medical service, and all what people need. And it is uh, really not easy task for governments. And I agree with people who said that uh, mainly wealthy countries have to give more financial support for education in the developing countries, education and um, development of technologies to improve level of living in these countries. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you. I, I I think um, it's, um, as a conclusion, I, I would say that it's very uh, clear that we have to elaborate and work on the common policies. It's, uh, it was stated by everyone that we, that we need a collaboration among the countries, rich countries and weak countries, that needs to get and to reach a certain economical and social uh, level. And I think that's... Uh, what was mentioned by the young lady from Afghanistan, it's very important to make sure that we exclude any kind of discrimination. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with my friend Abdulaziz that we have to learn to be kind to each other, to accept the fact that we are different and we have the, there are differences among us, but we are all human beings. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. State Secretary. Thank you. Thank you. I just, uh, I am also very thankful to all the comments and to presentations. I just would like to say that uh, in the topic of our today's panel, I would say that we see the migration as a, a result of uh, conflicts, uh, climate change, and, uh, but only I would say that uh, inequality, sometimes we may see the inequality as a result of uh, migration. The yeah. first migration happens then inequality. Mm -hmm. uh, we've start facing the inequality in this process. And uh, hearing all the presentation of our colleague, I see that this is one of the problems which yeah. is faced both in Mr. Abdulaziz's uh, speech and others. I believe uh, this is, uh, of course, related to our attitude. Attitude, how we treat the humans, how then, and what is needed, I believe, there is a need is solidarity. Yeah. So only by providing common solidarity, uh, we can find a solution to this issue. And I would like to make a short comment also to the question raised by uh, by young lady uh, on how we can uh, avoid discrimination in uh, mm -hmm. uh, going through the asylum and refugee applications. Of course, again, this is also first matter of approach. Uh, national level and second of course there is certain guidelines defined by international yeah. organizations so we should follow them and third of course there is mechanisms so that decision is made by board then yeah. there is a possibility to appeal it to the court and etc so okay. again I believe if we follow uh, all these best practices and uh, show the solidarity in the process we can achieve better result thank you thank you for your conclusion Madam. Yeah, thank you. Uh, two messages. One, don't leave Latin America behind because we have a huge problems, economical problems, and sometimes come to Europe or come to the United States, you know, through violence and 
many, many things. So I think that Latin America needs help in this, in, in especially in, with, with the, this migration that is, for us, is a huge migration. But education is the only way. And this is what Colombia is doing with the Venezuelans. All Venezuelans, since the beginning, have an education free. Um, and we are going to continue to do it. But when the money arrives, it's not for that. It's just NGOs doing things. So think that the budget of the countries need for education. Thank you. Mr. Altwachiri. Yes, sir. Uh, I think we should look at the immigration issue as a, hum a humanitarian issue. And uh, in this context, we have to make sure that uh, there are fair laws dealing with the uh, immigration issue, uh, solidarity among the world's countries and the international community and the international organizations to uh, provide uh, the, 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 the necessities that the, these people need. And finally, to stop uh, the uh, migration lords, like war lo lords who use wars to, to benefit and make uh, wealth. There are people who are using migration to make wealth as well and let those migrants, most of them, drown in the, in the seas. So this is a, 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 unit, a humanitarian issue that needs international cooperation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Then I go first Thank to the you. gentleman. I made a promise you have the last word, Madam President. OK. Yeah. I agree with what I said in the comments, and I say that نحن بحاجة إلى استراتيجية سياسية مجتمعية لإدماج المهاجرين في المجتمعات الذين التي يعيشون بها هذا هو الذي سيكافح التمييز والعنصرية ولكن نحتاج إلى خطوات جادة الأمر الثاني أريد أن أقول أن توفير المأوى والملاذ يفتح أبواب المستقبل توفير المأوى والملاذ للاجئين يفتح أبواب المستقبل في البلد الذي يعيشون فيه وإغلاقها يعني فقدان الحاضر وأختم بالتضامن مع الغارقين في جنوب إيطاليا في القارب الذي غرق وكان على متنه العديد من المهاجرين ومعظمهم من أفغانستان فأنا أعرب عن كل التعاطف والتضامن مع هؤلاء المفقودين شكرا Thank you very much uh, We come now to the close and before we give the word to Madame Serrano as women have always the last word I say you goodbye I say you thank you for your attention Madame Serrano you have the final thank you. word Thank you very much well, uh, I agree with some of the, of the questions that I uh, had made here, uh, principally about uh, talking about climate change and the influence in refugees. When we see what's happening, for example, in Central America, yes, violence is one factor, but another one is about uh, desertification, what's happening with the land, what's happening with the uh, hurricanes, the typhoons, and everything that's happening in, in uh, Central America. And Farida, you mentioned women issues. Um, approximately 50% of the refugees are women, and the situation for women is always, always worse uh, because of violations, or because of uh, lack of importance of women uh, work, and etc. And other thing that it's important to say is that we need um, like more equitable commerce rules because, uh, and I mentioned that when uh, sometimes I, I speak in, in European countries, uh, if the bananas of Ecuador, of the shrimps could be sold in a better way because they are uh, very small producers, we have a more equitable law probably the migration will be not as big as uh, now uh, it is. Then uh, we need more equitable laws. We need to uh, invest in education in the countries, non-developed countries, in the health uh, um, investment also to have uh, a better world. Then uh, last words is uh, about the hope that the world is going to be better because we need to have hope even in the worst and darkest moment of humanity, we need hope. Thank you very much. Yes.
Thank you all. Thank you. Can we make a picture of the panelists as a testimony that we go for it? <laughs> oh, we have a lot of issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.